We'll now have our first opening congregational song. It's in the new songbook addendum, which is in alphabetical order. Lean on me.
<laughs> I guess, is he youth anymore? He's college age now, I guess. That seems It's all perspective. <laughs> She's out of town this weekend. She's out of town this weekend. Okay. Well, um, in that case, uh, I've got some um, readings I'd like to do about um, our topic that um, Dr. Mark Wright is going to be um, speaking to us on today. And uh, the topic being, and he is a historian. I, I believe you taught at Georgia State. Is that correct? Uh, no. No. no? I, I, <laughs> taught in the Philippine uh, Department of Health in the uh, Uganda Ministry of Health. Oh, okay, so I'm completely wrong. But the topic is, is past, present, and, and future. Um, so there were lots of, of interesting uh, quotes on that, as you can imagine. Um, so the one I like, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. And then one you probably may have heard, this is an American proverb. I think uh, we don't know where it came from, but today is the first day of the rest of your life. Um, we have to get back to the beauty of just being alive in this present moment. And that's Mary McDonald. So now I think we're at um, time for silent meditation. <coughs> and um, if you will just take a few minutes to uh, spend time with your thoughts. Oh, and I'm going to be. Try to catch it, hold, hold on to it, hold it in your hand. It disappears every time. Alice Hoffman. Mm -hmm. um, and now is the time uh, when um, we will have some special music and the offering. Since our theme is, theme is about past and present and I do a little something about time, so I'll do something. Once upon a time, there was a tavern where we used to raise a glass or two.
will change it around a little bit and say, <laughs> These are the days of my friend. Continue, continue wearing masks um, and 
even if uh, COVID doesn't spike uh, in respiratory disease season, um, you, probably, you won't get influenza, which is a plus. Um, it's probable that COVID is going to become endemic at a low level, um, but the natural history of a disease is to, is to get milder and milder. Um, and that's because if you, if you kill off your, your host, there's nothing for your children to eat. <laughs> Is this okay? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, today we're talking about the past, the present, and the future. How can I uh, uh, call myself an existentialist when for the last 13 years I've been writing about the past? Good question. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, um, talk about thrones for a minute. Um, you know, you wake up in the morning and you feel like you're, you're thrown into the situation where you're disabled, you're old, uh, you're, you're whatever, and you have to start from there uh, to create uh, reality in the present. I think there's a bit of misunderstanding about Thronus, and I'd like to speak on behalf of Thronus, um, because people underrate it. Um, and I'd like to talk about St. Jim Morrison of the Doors. <laughs> he was the son of a rear admiral, and uh, he was born in Florida in 1943. Uh, and he attended uh, St. Petersburg Junior College and Florida State University. He was described as a voracious reader, often quoting Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher and poet. It seems a reasonable assumption that it was about this time that he began to become a rebel without a cause. As Morrison intoned many decades ago in Riders in the Storm, into this world were thrown. Uh, thrown. Thronness is the simple awareness that we always find ourselves somewhere, namely delivered over to a world with which we are fascinated, a world we share with others. Um, Thronness is um, perhaps a, a poor translation. Um, it, it's really more like context. Uh, we find ourselves in a context. It's not such a bad thing um, at all, um, even if it's a hard concept, uh, even if it's a hard context. <coughs> And there is a famous philosopher, Simon Critchley, who's currently at the New School, which is where Parsons School of Design, where Zuzu goes, uh, is. And Critchley, you know, philosophy tends to start out, everything is beautiful. Critchley is a bit of a negative Nelly. Uh, he started out. Everything sucks. Um, and we have to go for it. Um, and uh, we're always caught up in everyday life in the world. Um, but um, and Critchley went to uh, went to college in England, and then he went to France, where he studied postmodernism. And uh, um, um, Heidegger. And speaking of postmodernism, as someone who aspires to be an author, the concept of death of the author really doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> I, I get the point, you know, whatever you intend when you 
write something, it's the readers who, who interpret it and give it meaning, nonetheless. Um, but Critchley says there's another way of a, approaching the central insight of philosophy. Um, and uh, that we cannot exist independently of our relation to the world. And this relationship is a matter of mood and appetite, not rational contemplation. Mm. What about the past? Is there a past at all? William Faulkner said, the past is never dead. It's not even the past. <laughs> And what he means by that is that um, we constantly are reinterpreting the past in, in the present. Furthermore, when you think back to the past, you for, you've forgotten things like details of conversation. And so your brain substitutes likely stuff. Um, <laughs> So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. Uh, it's not like it's not like we we're bound to the past. It's like the past is always with us. Uh, it just doesn't rule us. She took the kids and moved to Boston. 
where she became an eminent neuropsychologist. I moved east to be near them and found a job as a hospital epidemiologist at Booth Memorial Medical Center in Queens, New York. I moved in with my best friend, Tom Dale Kiever, a Shakespearean actor. He lived in a tiny efficiency apartment in Manhattan's Hell's Kitchen neighborhood at 45th Street and 10th Avenue, a fourth-story walk-up above a salsa record studio. He was incredibly close to the big Broadway theaters. Great for him, but of limit, limit, util, limited utility to me. When you walked out the door of his building, you could look down 45th Street and see the hulking World War II aircraft carrier, the Intrepid. It is now a museum. He called it my neighborhood aircraft carrier. <laughs> Kiever was a bit eccentric. He ate mostly tuna, and his mantle sported a giant pyramid of empty tuna cans. <laughs> the crowning glory of the apartment was the bathtub. It stood in the middle of the room, topped with a door, which served as the table. A tiny kitchen and bathroom served, completed the amenities. He once played Macbeth in an off-off-Broadway show. The New York Times reviewed the show and said it sucked and was all his fault. <laughs> he told me, fuck up, that if they can't take a joke, Words to live by. <laughs> Back in those days, life in New York was tough. Um, actually, I don't want to exceed my time, and I'm proud that Pat isn't waving his arm. You have plenty of time. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Back in those days, New York was tough. One day, I walked into the lobby. Jessica and I lived the high life in 
the city, as opposed to the bridge and tunnel peasants who dwelt in the darkness of the outer boroughs. Of course, Queen was and is one of these. The hospital was in Flushing, Queens. You have no idea how many people sent me Chris cards, Christmas cards saying, Flushing, New York is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Driving to Booth was easy because I was going against traffic. I sometimes had to rush to the hospital in the middle of the night to see emergencies. The most direct route uh, was to get across up 125th Street and then head for the Tribal Road Bridge. And 125th Street was the border between Harlem and uh, the uh, Columbia types. Once I had to drive to Queens to see an emergency at 2 a.m., I had an almost new Ford Escort with front wheel drive. I sailed through green lights, crossing Harlem and 2nd Avenue when a guy in a pit car drove through the red light and smashed into my side. He backed up, which untangled our vehicles, with a sickening screeching of metal, and then he disappeared uptown. I climbed out and walked shakily to a gas station to call AAA. Life was more complicated before we all got cell phones. We don't make pickups there at night. I tried to send do you make pickups in the day? I tried to sound sarcastic to cover the fear shooting up into my chest. Sometimes, he hung on. I couldn't get a taxi either. I needed to think. I walked out to inspect the car to see if I could bend something to get it rolling again. No joke. Voices came from close behind me. Hey man, did you see the license plate on the car that hit you? I said, no. Well, we did. Thanks. Tell me how memorized. It don't work that way. You pay us and we tell them. <laughs> there were at least six of them, young kids wearing black leather jackets. They nudged closer and I backed up. Somehow they got me into a dark place behind the dumpster. At least the sanitation people would find my body. <laughs> you got $50? Show us your wall. A tiny ray of hope. They wanted to negotiate. Look, guys, the number probably wouldn't be any good. It's probably a stolen car. Yeah, a lot of those are going here, especially at night. So what will you pay us? How about a dollar? Man, man, you're not respecting us, the leader whined. They began pushing me back against the dumpster. I looked at my wallet. How about five? Deal. After the kids left, I moved to the center of 125th Street. I felt safer there. Nobody came. Then a tall black guy walked out of the gas station, holding two cups of coffee. Have a cup. You look like you had an accident. Yes, I said. I can't get the car to it, and no taxi will be anymore. That's Look, my uncle has a garage right around the corner. I help push it there, and then you can pick it up tomorrow. Wow, thanks. We managed to push it a couple of hundred feet to a closed garage door. My new friend knocked on the door and said something. It opened. Inside were blazing lights, a vision of hell. People were cutting out cars and wielding, wielding torches, taking off license plates, stacking doors against the wall, and yanking out engines. Holy shit! Yeah, it's a chop shop. How do I know your uncle's not going to chop mine? Out? My family are the ones who decide what to chop. And with all due respect, there's not much market for Ford Escorts. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I'll borrow a car and take you home. When we arrived, he leaned across the seat. This is going to cost you a hundred bucks, buddy. 
I don't have that much. Look, when I go to court, I have to pay hundreds of dollars to lawyers. They know the rules, get the contacts. You know what I mean? Yes. Think of me as a lawyer of the streets. I'll extend you credit till I pick you up in the morning. How can you be sure I'll pay? I know where you live, man. <laughs> Besides, I can sell the battery and tires uh, of the cars and make a hundred bucks. You can see how I made up almost all of the conversation. I, I was careful. I mean, this of course really happened. Uh, the guy really did. Uh, really was the lawyer of the street. The, uh, the kids really did back me behind the dumpster. But I filled in almost all the dialogue uh, that my memory had lost. Um, and that's an example of the past isn't really the past because we're constantly churning it around. So I hope after this talk, you constantly churn around these ideas that thrownness is really context, it's not a bad thing, as Jim Morrison said. And BTW, Jim Morrison was arrested six times, once for shoplifting and five for masturbating during uh, concerts. He had to move to France, uh, where uh, he later died and his uh, very compared Lecce's cemetery. Um, and if you visit it, it's piled with flowers and pictures of Morrison. Um, but of course, part of our context and his is uh, that he's dead and he's not around anymore. So I hope you keep these thoughts and uh, uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy thinking about them as much as I enjoy living through these events and still thinking about them. And my beloved and supportive wife um, has heard all of these stories. <laughs> and I want to thank her for supporting me in every way. I love her.
so Mary Howard has let me know that she has a whole slew of postcards that say uh, Vote Tuesday on uh, November 8th uh, with an accompanying uh, slew, oh, slew of Texas addresses. So if you want to help send these, uh, talk to her. So the, yeah, the Texas will be an important election. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, so we need some help, a few people to carry chairs and tables from yesterday, from downstairs to upstairs. If, uh, you know, if we have some folks who have strong backs, that would be very much appreciated. Anything else? Okay. Um, and now it's time for our closing congregational song, and that will be with a little help. From my friends. <laughs> 